A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitani Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I start in the name of Allah, the Beneficent and the Merciful. I seek salvation from Shaitan, the Accursed. Dearest viewers from all across the world, my brothers and sisters, Assalamu Alaikum Jamian wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. May the peace, blessings, and protection of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala be with you at all steps of your life. Welcome to the Ramadan show here exclusively on Imam Hussein TV with me, your host, Dr. Shabir Tijani. Once again, throughout this episode, we'll be covering a magnitude of facets about the month of Ramadan so that we can be your one-stop shop for this holy month. Please join us on social media where we can debate and we can discuss these topics from today using the hashtag on Twitter IHTV Ramadan. Please join us on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube as well. Please don't forget to send us your videos as well from wherever you are in the world so we can have an insight into how different people across the globe prepare for the holy month of Ramadan and how they run their day-to-day -day lives. I would like to also remind you to please remember us in your du'as as well and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your du'as. Before we commence onto the show, I would like to quote a hadith from Amir al muminin alayhi salam where he says, for surely life is a bridge and you should not build your homes on a bridge because as we travel through this life, it's a temporary life. The destination is somewhere else. So do not put all of your efforts into this materialistic and into worldly affairs. For this episode on the topic of spiritual refinement, I thought we would talk about the preparation for Laylatul Qadr as these holy nights are coming up over the next few days, the next few nights. It's very important for us as individuals, for us as the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to prepare ourselves in advance, to prepare, prepare ourselves physically, emotionally, mentally and spiritually. And in order to get the best out of these nights, it's very important to optimize our preparation. The preparation exists in many facets, so inshallah I'll be going through these facets during the course of this segment. The first way to obviously prepare yourself is physically. Get yourself physically ready for the night of Laylatul Qadr by identifying the place where you'll be praying. Make sure you're comfortable with that specific place and ensure the room isn't too hot, too cold. Make sure that all of your preparations for that room, setting up that room, are perfect. And then as the night approaches, make sure that you're not too sleepy. Make sure you've had plenty of rest through the day. And thirdly, make sure that when you if do iftar and you've eaten your food, make sure you've not eaten too much so it becomes burdensome for you, becomes heavy for you. You feel bloated and, and you feel tired. So make sure you're ready for it physically. It is also very important to prepare yourself mentally. Focus your thoughts on the importance of this night. And think about how unfortunate those people are who don't get the blessing of being able to participate on this night in the A'mal. Every time you think about the A'mal, remember your focus, remember your intention and you're near, make sure it's as clean and as pure as possible and it's for the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thirdly, it is important to prepare yourself emotionally. The way to do this would be primarily to make sure you're at peace with yourself, make sure you're content with your surroundings and you're satisfied with life in general. But then go further, make bonds with those with whom you've broken bonds before, people in your community, 
especially your family, your blood relatives. Ask their forgiveness for any wrongdoings that you may have done through the course of your life or recently. Forgive those individuals who have hurt you in the past and forget anything that they've done which may actually cause grudges within your heart. Because whenever you have a grudge in your heart, it is almost like you're imprisoned within that hate. So release yourself from that prison. Prepare yourself for this night by being free. Remember, the reward for goodness is only good. The next step is to prepare yourself spiritually. The way to do this is to read the dua and the a'mal that you'll be reciting and try to understand the translation of it so you can really connect to it when you're reciting it during the night of Laylatul Qadr. When reciting the names of the Ma'asumin, when remembering the Ma'asumin, try to connect to every single one of them. Remember them, remember their stories, remember the messages and the morals that they're left behind. Remember their life history as well. Because by remembering that, you will not only be jogging your memory, but you'll also be teaching yourself morals from their life because they're the ultimate guides. And when you're asking for forgiveness, this is the most important thing. Make sure your heart is soft. Make sure your heart is so soft that you're able to cry for forgiveness. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves that servant of His that can go through the night and cry and beg for forgiveness. And there's no night better than this to cry for forgiveness. So make your heart soft. When it comes to the night itself, prepare yourself and divide these nights into three portions. The first part should be dedicated to gaining knowledge. So before you engage yourself in the A'mal, listen to some lectures, read some books, make notes, so that you can actually learn something positive. Because proactivity and gaining knowledge in itself is ibadah. The second part is dedicated to meditation. It is dedicated to asking yourself the questions about life, the philosophical values of life. Where do I wish to go? Where have I come from? What do I wish to attain from this life? And for every question, beseech your Lord, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you inspiration to answer these questions because let's face it, a lot of them are rhetorical, a lot of them are matters of deep contemplation and matters for which you won't find easy answers. So ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you. And finally, and thirdly, this night is dedicated to worship. The whole night, if you can, try and spend it in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember it in the remembrance of the Aimma. Remember it for yourself as well. Remember your, your bad deeds. Remember the mercy of Allah upon you. And like I said before, cry and beg for that forgiveness because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never as close to you as He is when you're able to cry for and, and ask Him for forgiveness. The Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, has said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala favors Friday above all other days. He favors the month of Ramadan over all other months. And he favors the night of Qadr above all other nights. So remember, you are living through and you're making use of this night, which is more important than any other night in the Islamic calendar. Sulaiman al-Marzawi asked Imam Ali al could you please tell us why Surah Qadr was revealed? The Imam replied and he said, O Sulaiman, the night of Qadr is a night when Allah decrees what happens to you through the course of the year and what will happen to you up to the following Laylatul Qadr. Use this night to ask for Allah for sustenance and whatever He will decree is your destiny. Therefore, remember how important this night is. All of the A'imma salam, have placed specific emphasis on this night. And it is said in Surah Al-Qadr, 
Allah considers this night to be better than a thousand months, which is approximately 80 years of worship. Imagine being able to gain 80 years of worship in one night. What an achievement that would be. Prophet Musa, peace and blessings be upon him, once addressed Allah saying, Lord, I desire to be near you. Allah said, whoever, desired, whoever desires nearness to me is the one who remains awake through the night of Qadr doing ibadah. Prophet Musa said, O Lord, I wish to earn your mercy. Allah said, My mercy is granted to anyone who is merciful to the underprivileged on the night of Qadr. Prophet Musa said, Lord, I wish to pass on the right path. Allah replied, That is granted to those who give sadaqah during the night of Qadr. Prophet Musa said, Lord, I wish to enjoy the trees and the fruits of Jannah. Allah replied, he says, this is granted to anyone who praises me during the nights of Qadr. Prophet, Muhammad, Prophet Musa said, Lord, I wish to achieve salvation from the hellfire. Allah says, this is granted to that person who, be, who begs for forgiveness on the night of Qadr. Finally, Prophet Musa says, Lord, I wish to achieve your pleasure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, I shall be pleased with anyone who prays two mustahab rakats of salah during the nights of Qadr. So brothers and sisters, I hope that this insight has been a valuable experience for you and it's inspired you to prepare yourself for the upcoming nights because surely these nights are special and who knows whether we'll get another opportunity to partake through the a'mal and through Laylatul Qadr. Finally, I would very humbly ask you to remember myself and the whole of the Imam Hussein TV team in your dua on this very special night, on the nights of Qadr. And most importantly, please, please do not forget to pray for the, and, uh, pray for the reappearance of the awaited Al-Mahdi alayhi salam. And also do not forget that there are many underprivileged people in this world and they rely on our du'as as well so please do not forget them in your du'as on this night. Imam Ali, commander of the faithful, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, has said, The month of Ramadan has approached you. It is the chief of all months and the beginning of the year. Today in this episode, where we go around the world to look at how people prepare their day-to-day -day lives for the month of Ramadan. We're going to focus on a country in North Africa. This country is known as Egypt. There is uh, a many, many Muslims there. It's currently a Muslim country. And as a result, the entire population, or majority of the entire population, they, they celebrate and they prepare themselves for the month of Ramadan. Before this holy month begins, Many of the houses there, they prepare by doing a deep cleanse of the house, cleaning almost like a spring clean. And after that, they try and decorate the house with green material and lanterns. Now, for these people, the lanterns are a sign of Ramadan. It's a very cultural and a traditional thing. During the daytime, most of the people, like in many of the hotter countries around the world, they tend to close their shops during the long periods of the afternoon where it's very, very hot, and they tend to reopen their shops in the evening. After the time of iftar, they tend to get together as families and as communities 
in order to eat iftar, after which the family members, men, women, children alike, they all go to the mosque or their local centers to join in the, the dua and the a'mal um, and the majlis, if there is one. And the interesting thing about Egyptian culture, especially in the month of Ramadan, is that they, they like to have their food split into three parts, just like they do during the day, like we have breakfast, lunch and dinner. They would usually have their breakfast or the, the portion of food that they would have for breakfast at iftar time. Then they would go to the mosque. After they come back from the mosque, they would have what we would call lunch. And then after a small break, just before suhoor, they would have their dinner portion of their daily meals. Just like Egypt, there are many other countries in North Africa, but Egypt has its own traditions and is very subtly different from the rest of the countries in that area. For those of you who don't know, Egypt is a, a very large Muslim country and one of its main sources of income is tourism. There's many, many people from around the world that go there and they get to view this spectacle firsthand. It's known as the land of the pharaohs because there's a lot of architecture from the times of ancient Egypt. During my time here and as I'm preparing for the episodes, I'm doing a lot of research into different parts of the world and how they prefer, prepare for the month of Ramadan, what they do on their day-to-day -day lives to try and accommodate for this month in order to get as much as they can out of this, this holy month. However, I would be very grateful and as a channel would be very grateful if you could send in your videos to show us from wherever you are in the world how you prepare for this holy month, for what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, what you do for work, how you prepare your meals, what you do after iftar. All of these things are very interesting for us so we can get an insight into different parts of the world, different people from around the, around the globe and how they prepare for this holy month, be it in the east or the west, whether you're in a Muslim or a non-Muslim country. It would be very interesting for us to see and for the rest of the world to see as well. Because inshallah, we hope to be able to air these videos that you send. Until then, we move on to the next segment of the show. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Dearest viewers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh May peace and blessings of Allah be upon each and every one of you And may all your supplications and prayers be accepted by Allah during the holy month of Ramadan Today we came to one of the stores in the holy city of Karbala that sells souvenirs Not typical souvenirs of the holy city of Karbala, but special souvenirs. So stay tuned with us as we go and we will have a word with the manager and the store owner. Mm -hmm. السلام عليكم. عليكم السلام ورحمة الله. ممكن تعرفنا بحضرتك وتتفضل لنا عن الأجواء الرمضانية بمدينة كربلاء المقدسة. يا أهلا وسهلا بكم شرفتونا أنا سد رياض القزويني ابن هذه المحافظة المقدسة كربلاء. صراحة شهر رمضان في محافظة كربلاء لها أو له نكهة خاصة تختلف عن عن بقية المدن والدول اللي كنا. عايشين فيها طبعا وهذه ميزة أنها بجوار الحسين سلام الله عليه بجوار العباس هذه إلها روحانية خاصة. سيد رياض is one of the inhabitants of the holy city of Karbala. I asked him about the atmosphere of the holy city of Karbala. He's saying that the holy city of Karbala is so special and especially during the holy month of Ramadan. Uh, he has been living outside of Iraq for a while. Uh, he is saying that this atmosphere is totally different uh, as we are close to one of the greatest individuals in the Islamic history, being Imam Al Hussein. Uh, Sayyidna, what is the service that you give to the visitors of Imam Al Hussein? 
سلام الله عليك يا عبد الله في الواقع مشروع هدية كربلاء هو مشروع ثقافي قبل أن يكون تجاري فإحنا في الواقع مع هذا المشروع الحمد لله الله وفقنا أنه نفذ هذا المشروع حاولنا أنه نجيب ثقافة جديدة في المجتمع يعني بحيث نرتقي بالبضاعة الإسلامية والكربلائية تحديدا أنه إلى متى الزائر اللي يجي إلى كربلاء يأخذ مثلا تربة الحسين هذا التراب المقدس الذي فيه الشفاء يأخذ بعلب معدنية أو يأخذ بأكياس ورقية أو أو ما شابه فإجينا رتبناها خليناها في باكيجات مرتبة شوية ارتقينا مثل ما قلت لك بالبضاعة الإسلامية في الواقع هو ثقافة جديدة حسينا أنه لازم يكون أدنى شيء في كربلاء I ask the brother uh, Riyadh about what they uh, serve the visitors with. Uh, he's saying that we came up with an idea to uh, modernize and develop the souvenir of the holy city of Karbala. Instead of being a, a simple soil uh, or torba or tasbih, uh, we came and uh, modernized these uh, souvenirs to be some uh, modern and cultural. And this, the project that they have here is more cultural than beneficial. During this episode, in the health tips and medical advice section, I want to follow on from what I was talking about over the last few episodes. And we talked about the stages of life. Yesterday we talked about old age and one of the most commonest complaints or commonest problems that the elderly have is joint problems, joint pains, arthritis. We hear all of these terms bandied around, but do we really know what it's about? Before we go into what, what it is and how, how you can treat it. Let's just talk a little bit about what is causing it. Essentially, joint pain can be separated or arthritis can be separated in many different segments, different sections. The most commonest form of arthritis or joint pains is called osteoarthritis. We say it's wear and tear. It's when, you're, when you're, the, the cartilage, the lining of your bones and the joints have degenerated over time. And as a result, the bones are grinding against each other and causing the pain. However, in younger people who don't have degeneration of their cartilage, they can also get osteoarthritis, but it's just a faster process. Before I go into treatment of arthritis, I think it's really important to break arthritis down into the different sections and for you to be aware and the signs to look out for when you are suffering from joint pain to self. As we've mentioned, in, in elderly people, the commonest form of joint problems is osteoarthritis. It's not to say that there is no more or not other types of arthritis that could be causing the problem. But in younger people who suffer from joint problems and joint deformities, it is very important to try and show them or highlight specific symptoms to look out for so that you can visit your doctor and try and get tested for the more serious types of arthritis. The arthritis that, if not treated, can leave you with joint deformities, which are very severe. And these fall under a category called inflammatory arthritis. I'm sure many of you at home have heard of rheumatoid arthritis, but there is other types of arthritis as well that can, that can cause joint pains and that can actually, over a prolonged period of time, cause a lot of other problems around the body. Inflammatory arthritis is caused by inflammation of the synovium. The synovium is the lining around the joint itself. And when you have antibodies that attack the lining of the synovium, it causes inflammation and that's why this is called inflammatory arthritis. And it's really important to look out for specific signs. 
because these are the signs that will get you to see your doctor and hopefully get investigated and then treated. The first type of inflammatory arthritis I want to talk about is the most commonest form of inflammatory arthritis and that's called rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis generally affects people who are slightly younger, usually middle-aged people, but it's not to say it can't affect the very young or the very old. And usually it's joint pains all over the body, multiple joints affected, and it's a symmetrical distribution where both sides of the body, joints in both side of the, sides of the body are affected. People with rheumatoid arthritis can have other symptoms as well, such as lung problems, heart problems, they can also go on to develop kidney problems. So it's very, very important that if you notice that you're getting pains, that you actually see a doctor very quickly and to get tested. Other signs to look out for is that in rheumatoid arthritis, and in fact in all inflammatory arthritis, you get stiffness first thing in the morning when you wake up. And this stiffness is actually worse than the pain. And the stiffness lasts for about an hour or so in the morning. And it can last for longer in some people. So if you're finding that your joints are very stiff, it's both sides and that it's causing you a lot of trouble to, to lead your day-to-day -day life. I would suggest you go and see your doctor and they can do a simple blood test in order to diagnose you with this condition. Other forms of inflammatory arthritis are things like psoriatic arthritis or even lupus can cause joint problems. Again, with these joint problems, you will notice that the distribution is on both sides of the body. You'll notice that joints all over the body are affected. It's not just specific joints like osteoarthritis which can just affect a single joint or a couple of joints. And also with psoriatic arthritis some people also have psoriasis which is a skin condition which I'll get up to or I'll get to in future episodes. In younger people, in the very young, you can also have joint problems especially of the knee and the hips. These are very important if you're, if you're really having pain in the knees and the hips to go and see a doctor because it can be a sign of more sinister causes. Young people who are teenagers can have what we call growing pains where when their body grows very quickly the muscles and the tendons and the ligaments are stretched which causes pains in the joints. And if it's something as simple as that you can go and visit your general practitioner or your doctor and they'll be able to tell you that it's just that that's the problem. But if you're a young person with joint pains, do go and see the doctor and make sure that it isn't anything more sinister. The other condition that affects young people is something called ankylosing spondylitis, which again is a joint pathology, a joint problem, and mainly it affects specific joints. So the main joint pain that they get is pain in the lower back, in a region that we call the iliosacral region and they also get pain in their spine and what happens is in the mornings they find it very difficult to move around, they get very stiff and they find that their pain actually improves with exercise and with time. If you do suffer from any of these symptoms it is very very important that you go and see your doctor and your general practitioner so that they can give you advice, they can investigate you and treat you if needed. Now moving on to the treatments like I've said the vast majority of people who suffer from arthritis actually have degenerative arthritis which is also called osteoarthritis. As I've said osteoarthritis is, is the degeneration of the cartilage between in the joint space and therefore the bones rub against each other and cause pain. The main treatment for this in, initially are symptomatic relief and it's really important that you're aware of the types of medications you can take. My advice to you would be to start off with something simple like paracetamol and then work your way up if you're taking anti-inflammatory medication on a regular basis it is very important to see your doctor because things like ibuprofen or other medications that can help co um, ease the pain of inflammation can actually cause problems with the stomach so it's very important that you see a doctor so that they can prescribe you medication that will protect the stomach or to give you something else which will um, not harm the stomach as much such as a very weak uh, opioid medication which is a, a weak Another, another form of uh, painkiller. Other things you can do is get heat packs and gel packs which can um, help ease the pain and the swelling. People who suffer a lot from arthritis, from osteoarthritis especially, tend to find that over time the mobility gets so bad 
that even the, the painkillers don't help. Steroid injections some people have into their joints, which is very good. It's worth everyone who is suffering from osteoarthritis considering this as it gives you a prolonged period of, uh, of, of relief from the pain. However, in some people it doesn't work. And for those, um, the next step is obviously trying other, other types of stronger painkillers and then eventually working their way up to joint replacement. Joint replacement obviously is a very, very, uh, uh, it's a very uh, complicated decision to make and it's a, de a decision that will stay with you for the rest of your life. And it's very important to, when you do get referred on for joint replacement, speak to the surgeon and speak about the potential complications of surgery because um, having done an orthopedic job before, I'm aware of the problems of infected joints for people who've had knee and hip replacements in the past. So be fully aware of the of potential complications you can get. And also, if you do have a joint replacement, it will still affect your mobility. It's not like you will have your joints back to how they were when you were a lot younger. Finally, in people who suffer from the inflammatory form of arthritis, so rheumatoid arthritis or, or uh, psoriatic arthritis, or even ankylosing spondylitis, they will have uh, immune modulation treatment. So this is things that can start off from simple measures such as steroids and they can w go up to very high strength immune suppressors such as methotrexate for example. It is very important to realize that people who are taking this medication can become infected or can ha get recurrent infections because what this medication does is that it suppresses your immune system because it is the overproduction of specific antibodies that actually causes the uh, inflammation and the arthritis. So for those of you who are taking immunosuppressants or any medications that will affect your immune system, it is really important that you, you see your doctor very quickly if you have any infections because you may need antibiotics or any other, uh, or, or any other treatments. Finally, for people who do suffer from very severe forms of inflammatory arthritis, there have been new studies that have been done in which injectable forms of immunomodulators have been found to be helpful. It is very important that if you get to that stage of uh, inflammatory arthritis, now, so that's not osteoarthritis, it's the other forms of arthritis such as rheumatoid, psoriatic or ankylosing spondylitis, that you're under the care and supervision of a specialist because the medications that are prescribed and these high strength and high dosages of immunosuppressants you, you may need regular blood tests to make sure that your inflammatory markers and your um, blood cells, the, the white blood cells which can Im, uh, modulate your immune system are at a satisfactory level. And finally, just to say that those who are suffering from inflammatory arthritis, if they don't get seen very promptly and don't get treatment in due course, can go on to develop osteoarthritis. And also, people with inflammatory arthritis can get problems with their hearts and their kidneys and also their lungs. So it's really important that you get seen to very quickly. In terms of day-to-day -day exercises and help that you can get, it's very important to exercise regularly, but stick to your limits. If you over-exercise with osteoarthritis or any other form of arthritis, you can be in a lot of pain. So make sure that you, 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 you do exercise regularly because it will help your joints stay supple and stay moving, but at the same time, don't overexert yourself. And there are other things you can do in order, order to keep your, your, um, your weight down because one of the other risk factors for osteoarthritis is, is high BMI. So being overweight can actually put a lot of pressure on your joints and can actually uh, pre, uh, predispose you to getting osteoarthritis later on in your life. So it's really important to maintain a healthy lifestyle, to eat the right things. So eat um, uh, foods that are high and rich in omega-3 and um, they, some studies have shown, or anecdotally in fact, uh, we've been told that uh, other things like cod liver oil have been shown to help the joints. But if you do have a very balanced and healthy lifestyle, a good diet, you should be fine and you should be able to um, have uh, a good joint protection. Finally, in passing, I just want to conclude by saying that as a, as a community and as a, as a society, it's very important that 
you, you stay active and stay mobile. And if there's anything that is affecting your mobility and your independence, it is important that you get prompt treatment, prompt investigation and prompt treatment into that so that you may lead an active lifestyle because essentially one of the things that will get you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to be active not only physically but also being active physically will, will allow your soul to elevate as well. So inshallah, stay active, stay proactive and inshallah you will gain a lot of success in this world and in the hereafter. Once Prophet Sulaiman, peace be upon him, said that he would have a son from each of his wives. However, since he did not leave the fulfillment of his desires upon the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by saying, Insha'Allah, only one of his wives bore a child, and even then it was still born. When Sulaiman realized his mistake, he became sorry and asked for the, for, for the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In return, he asked Allah to grant him a kingdom which no one has ever had before and will never have after him. For this reason Allah accepted his prayers and granted him a mighty kingdom also known the kingdom of Prophet Sulaiman. He also gave him powers over the jinns, birds, animals and over the wind. They all had to obey his orders and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also taught Sulaiman the languages of, the languages of all the creatures on earth. At the command of Sulaiman, they built huge temples, fortresses, towers, places and palaces of, made out of glass and huge and large water reserves. Once Prophet Sulaiman, peace be upon him and his army of jinn and animals were passing over, were passing over a valley of ants. Seeing the glory of the army, the chief of ants alerted, that they, alerted the ants to go into their holes so the army will not trample over them. With the help of the wind, Prophet Sulaiman, peace be upon him, heard the chief of the ants and smiled and ordered his army to not step forward until the ants have gone into their holes. He then addressed the chief of the ants, how could my army trample over you when we were passing way above you in the air? And don't you know that I am the prophet of Allah and cannot hurt anyone unjustly? The ant replied, O Prophet of Allah, I did not warn them because of any harm that they may suffer from. However, I was afraid that they would forget the glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they seen your army. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In this particular episode, I want to dedicate the recitation, the poetry to a nasheed that I've heard recently by a very famous nasheed artist, Mahar Zain. The nasheed is called Freedom. The reason why I want to recite it is because all around the world we see this tyranny, bloodshed, suppression of voices, innocent lives being taken. And as the lovers of the Ahlul Bayt, it is upon us and incumbent upon us to make a stand against any form of evil, any form of tyranny, any form of oppression. Gathered here with, Gathered my, family, here with my family, my neighbors and my friends, friends standing firm standing together, together against, against the oppression, oppression holding, holding hands. hands. Doesn't matter where Not you're where from, you're from. If, you're if you're young old young woman or man, or man. we're here for the we're same for reasons, the same we, reasons want we want to take back. back. Our land. Our land. Oh God, God, thank you for giving us giving strength us to strength hold on. And now we're here now together, we're here together calling, you calling you for freedom, freedom. freedom. We know you we know won't you let us fall. Let us fall. Oh God. Oh God. We're calling, We're calling for freedom, for freedom fighting, fighting for freedom. freedom. 
We know you can hear our call. Oh God, we know you're here with us. No more being prisoners in our homes. And no more being afraid to talk. Our dream is to be free, just to be free. Now we've taken our first steps towards a life of complete freedom. We can see our dreams getting closer and closer. We're almost there. Oh God, thank you for giving us strength to hold on. And now we're here together, calling you for freedom, freedom. We know you won't let us fall. Oh God, we're calling for freedom, fighting for freedom. We know you can hear our call. Oh God. We know you're here with us. We know you're here with us. Imam Ali, commander of the faithful, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, has said, The month of Ramadan has approached you. It is the chief of all months and the beginning of the year. As I end this episode, I would just like to leave you with a final thought, something that you can ponder over and after this episode think about and inshallah it will allow you to improve and increase in your spirituality. That thought and that saying that I want to leave with you is that no matter how high the mountain is or however many obstacles you can see along the way, if you look, look close enough to the ground, you will always see a small stepping stone which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in front of you. And using those stepping stones, you can reach towards the top of the mountain. Surely if we employ that saying into our lives, and rather than looking at the destiny or at the, at, in the distance and looking at the, at, the, at the final place that we want to end up, even though that is our objective, if we look along the road at every little step of the way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places something there for us in order to help us to get to that end, end goal, end place. I would like to remind you once again to join us on Twitter by using the hashtag IHTVRamadan, to join us on Facebook, Instagram, and on YouTube, inshallah, this video will be uploaded tomorrow. Please also don't forget to remember us in your du'as. More importantly, do not remember to pray for the reappearance of the Hujjah, alayhi salam. Inshallah, I bid you farewell, and I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. And insha'Allah, until then, wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.